Make sure this is recording. Awesome. So big one today. Welcome everybody to the chat. We have the one and only Dan Richardson in with us today. Now, Dan, what I would like you to do for us is just quickly go into your background. What is it that you do and what is it that you help athletes do in general? Yeah, no, definitely. So as I said, I'm Dan Richardson. Uh, I'm a performance nutritionist. I work in professional sport and I also work as a consultant uh, with individual athletes and clubs, teams, the like. Uh, my background tended, I started from a young age, I suppose. I used to be really into rugby, made it to the point that I was a semi-professional rugby player in rugby league, not rugby union, which I you know might upset a few people watching, um, but didn't quite make it to that kind of heights. And it was a conversation that I had with my dad when I was about 17, 18, uh, and effectively offered a contract to play semi-pro again at 18 or go off to university and study sports science. And uh, in the words of my dad, he said, you're a good rugby player, but you're not that good. So I decided to go off, study sports science, and then that led me down the path of nutrition. I uh, went on to do a master's degree in sports nutrition. And I suppose I've spent the last kind of four or five years working with pro athletes. So straight out of uni, straight into a, a role that was full time uh, with a rugby club as a nutritionist. And then from there, it's just kind of expanded and grown in terms of the sports I've worked with and places I've been. So all the guys that we work with are specifically footballers. So if you could give like a quick background, like, what you've done in the world of football. I know you're yeah. a big guy as well, yeah. football. We yeah. Are. yeah. Rugby was where it started, um, and then from there, I've kind of I've worked with, I suppose, two main football clubs. Uh, I worked a little bit for around six months with Man City's academy. Uh, I was a nutrition assistant there, so nothing major. Didn't make any big decisions. Didn't work with any players that you probably see in the first team now. Um, but you know, still good to get that experience under my belt when I was a young nutritionist. Uh, I've spent a lot of time working with various football teams. Uh, Lincoln City, I worked a little bit with and still do with their academy. And then most notably, I suppose at the moment, I'm working with Leeds United's football club. And I think one of the reasons I was tricky to get on, should we say, Dylan, to start with was because I was, uh, I wouldn't say stuck with the first team, but I was working uh, with the first team for a few months as their head, interim head of nutrition. Um, and now I'm back with the academy as their academy nutrition lead. So I effectively see, oversee the programmes from the under nines all the way through to the under 21s and the transition players that you see falling into that first team squad at Leeds. Um, so work with them in terms of developing strategies for performance and also health based nutrition to keep them obviously ticking over um, and developing as athletes. That is awesome. I know whenever we were talking a couple of weeks ago, you were telling me that you couldn't get on because you were just so deep in with the first team and taking over in that room. So like, I'm sure everybody watching this video would like to know more about what it was actually like to do the nutrition side of things for Leeds first team. Like how was that for you and like, what did that entail? Yeah, certainly very different to my academy role. Uh, my academy role is mainly focused on education, development, supporting athletes from a one-to-one -one level to be able to improve and develop with their nutrition. And I'm sure we'll crack onto that a little bit later on in terms of mm -hmm. tips and ways of doing that. With the first team, it was very much more, I want to say, of a an admin kind of nutrition role in terms of sorting hotels, uh, well, the food for the hotels, ensuring that the right foods are out at the right times for the players. As you've got to imagine with an academy, we've kind of got you know many different age groups in that are all on different match days. So it's quite difficult sometimes to be able to create a menu that kind of suits all of those individual needs from a team perspective. Whereas with the first team, you have 20 to 30 athletes where, you know, you're trying to deliver a bespoke menu to support them. So pasta stations, fueling stations, things such mm -hmm. as that. Um, there was quite a few incidences where normally, I suppose it's probably been a couple of years since I've been pitch side with a team. Um, I tend to enjoy from the stands uh, at the moment when it comes to the academy and kind of take a back seat um, and make sure all the nutrition's done prior to that. Whereas with the first team, it was very much getting into the changing rooms, giving the lads what they need from supplements to hydration, and then actually being out on the pitch um, and throwing the water bottles on the pitch as and when needed. So I, as I said, a glorified water boy uh, could have been one of my titles when I was with the first team. But, you know, being in the thick of it was brilliant, really enjoyed it. And like day to day, um, it's just kind of high performance, high intensity um, all the way through, you know, six, seven days a week in with the players supporting them from, you know, a fueling perspective, but also making sure they're recovering well with the right kind of strategies that we can use. Awesome. That must have been very enjoyable for yourself. I've seen a few videos of you throwing out like the water bottles on the touchline and stuff. And I was like, that would be absolutely class to do, be in the thick of that. 
Um, so something that I would be interested to know, is there any footballers at that elite level who would be kind of similar to the guys at the lower level who would be like picky eaters or anything like that? Would there be anything like that? And how do you overcome that if there is? Yeah, certainly. I think at that level, you kind of, I suppose they're not picky eaters anymore. They're just set in their ways, I think is the best way of describing it. Um, you know, unlike some of the younger athletes that I work with who don't want to eat a certain food because it looks a certain way or, you know, potentially they've never tried it and it looks a little bit foreign to them. Um, I think with the first team players, it was more routine um, and kind of regulation of themselves. You know, they know what food they like, dislike. They know what foods they want on a match day. You know, I've never seen so many, you know, young male footballers all having the same meal at the same time before mm -hmm. a match every single week. So every week it would be, you know, if it's the pasta station, it's the same combination of leaves, greens, um, you know, chicken, etc. Or if it's, you know, a breakfast meal, it's the same kind of two poached eggs with some smoked salmon uh, on a sourdough piece of toast, for example, would be like one of the one of the ways. And then you get some of the more obscure ones that's like they want a ham and cheese butty before the play, or they want a uh, you know beans on toast with a sprinkle of cheese or whatever it might be. And that's just set rituals from you know kind of when they were younger. So not necessarily fussy or picky as which we see sometimes with the academy players, but certainly kind of like setting routines and making sure that as a nutritionist, the food's available for them to support them with that. Yeah, I feel when it comes to the higher level athletes, they're not really turned so much about like the taste of the food, it's the quality of the food and they just want to make sure that they're feeling good and they're feeling so they can be at their best. So whether it be something that they don't really enjoy, they'll, they'll eat it anyway just to get that extra level of performance in, would you agree? Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, they, they look at it as more scientific, like carbs, fats, mm -hmm. proteins, and they look at what's in that that's going to give them the best opportunity. There is some players I've worked with in the past, not necessarily at Leeds, but other clubs that, you know, won't have pasta because it causes a flare up with their with their stomach. Mm -hmm. So they'll opt yeah. for something like rice or potatoes instead. So they're looking more from a performance benefit. Like realistically, I've seen players eating dry, like almost like dry pasta, no sauce, because they know they need the pasta, but they don't like bolognese sauce or whatever it is that's offered with it. So they're not fussed uh -huh. about the taste and texture. They just want to get the fuel in to be able to perform mm -hmm. the absolute best. So I agree with you there, certainly. Awesome, awesome. So in relevance to a lot of the guys that would be in this group and could be watching this video, like the biggest struggle that I see for my athletes and these guys is just they are busy athletes. This isn't their full-time job. They have a full-time job. They're in full-time education and they're trying to balance their training, their gym work. And then what I find is what they're struggling with is their nutrition because it kind of falls in the last place. Okay, so... What advice would you give to someone who's maybe just starting out and trying to improve their nutrition? Like they're just getting into it and they're looking to improve it now. Like what advice would you give to them starting off? Yeah, I think you've got to start with the basics and the basics is essentially fueling correctly. Like it doesn't matter what types of food you actually have to begin with. It's about getting that food in the body. I think the biggest thing I see with youth athletes that aren't within an academy structure or system is they account for their training. They might be brilliant and having a flapjack before training and a protein shake or a milkshake after training. But they don't think about what they're doing at college or at school for the rest of the day in terms of fueling up for that performance. Mm -hmm. So I think just focusing in on doubling up on your carbs on a training day and ensuring that you're getting plenty of fruit and veg in, I think are the first two tips for anybody that's just starting, never kind of focused on the nutrition at all, is like, you know, most athletes say you need five a day fruit and veg, but realistically, somewhere between seven and 10 is much better. And that sounds mm -hmm. ridiculous when we just say like, what, so we're going to have seven bananas or 10 apples, not quite like that, but it's a case of with porridge oats, you might have, you know, some blueberries and some chopped up strawberries on it then a banana on your way into school to give you a bit more energy and also contribute to your fruit and veg contribution. At lunch, you might have, you know, a sandwich if that's all that's on offer at the canteen, but maybe you pick up a side salad and a pot of pineapple. There's another two of your 10 a day that we're looking towards getting. And you can see how this is developing then. So it's a case mm -hmm. of high carb, high fruit and veg every day where possible, especially when training. And I think if we can focus on them to begin with, it'll start those building blocks as an athlete to be able to kind of climb that pyramid to sports performance nutrition. Awesome. Great answer. Love that. Um, so we talked a lot there about healing performance. And something that I would like to learn a wee bit more from yourself is 
how to optimally fuel yourself for a game. So it's a day or two before the game. What are the strategies that you would advise to fuel yourself best for the game to optimize your performance on your game day? 100%. Yeah. So most <clears throat> athletes probably watching this that might not have put much emphasis on their nutrition for a game so much yet would probably think mm -hmm. oh, the morning of the game, I'm going to get a good breakfast in. If you want to eat like the pros, you need to start thinking three days in advance. So we think we go for match day minor structure, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with as well, Dylan, from a performance perspective. So we start at match day minus three with our nutrition strategy. Now it's nothing drastic, it's nothing crazy. We don't need to be mm -hmm. filling a notebook full of uh, full of notes from today's session. It's quite simple. You first kind of match day minus three, which means three days prior to a match, mm -hmm. I call um I call it like the optimization phase, which is effectively no skipping meals, ensure that you're getting that fruit and veg in and carbs that we mentioned early on, and make sure we're staying hydrated and a good night's sleep. Tick those four boxes. We're in a good place, minus three, leading into that game that's over here. Then if we're looking towards minus two, I consider that our transitional phase. So that's where we move from kind of our standard conventional foods and nutrition that we'd have for all our training and performance into a more specific strategy for our game day, which is coming up in two days. So a little bit more emphasis on the quality of carbohydrates we're having. So we're looking for those long, uh, long lasting starchy carbs over sugary carbs on that day. We're trying to stay really well hydrated. So ensuring that whenever we go to the toilet, our urine color is nice and pale. We're never hitting mm -hmm. that dehydration phase. And then some good kind of protein and carbs before bed to recover and replenish what we might have lost from that match day minus two training session, which typically is a lighter load than what minus three would have been anyway, because we're getting closer mm -hmm. to the game. Then we're at the day before the game, minus one. So match day minus one. I call it our loading phase. And that's not to be mistaken with carb loading. What it means is we're going to slightly increase our carbohydrate intake, but not drastically. We're not marathon runners. We're not triathletes. We don't need that much energy in the body. And realistically, it's going to slow us down on the day of performance. So yes, we're going to put an emphasis on carbs, but typically we're going to throw maybe two or three more snacks into the day that are high carb and then look in, at our meals, we're going to start to double down on our carbs. So if having a pasta dish, we're going to put an extra spoonful of pasta on there. If we're having you know, potentially chicken wraps, we might turn that into a burrito and throw ah. kind of a few spoonfuls of, of rice in there to give it that kind of bulk of carbs. So that's your minus one, which is your loading phase. So you kind of go from optimized transition to load. And then actually day of a match, most of the work's done then. You've kind of prepped the body, got yourselves ready to go. It's the case of having a good carby breakfast, making sure that if we have got time for lunch, so three hours prior to performance, we're getting a good carby lunch in as well, alongside some snacks that we can just drop in as and when we need them that are high carb and also going to support our performance. And then obviously that should effectively build us all the way from that kind of if the game's on a Saturday all the way kind of from you know Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday game and then we're good to go from there yeah that's very interesting because I think well I know for myself personally the mistakes I would have made would I would have started my like carb load on the day of the game and that yeah. morning like I would have had a big carb breakfast and a big like bowl of pasta maybe two hours previous to the game and then it would just leave you feeling bloated, run down. It's not digestive. That's not being used as energy. And it's actually slowing you down. So it's interesting that you say you go the whole way back to three days. Um, do you have any like set goals and metrics for the athletes to have? Like prior to the game day, something that I use is six to eight grams of carbs per kilo. Would you agree with that range? Or is there a certain range that you would use or... Yeah, so typically with football, is six to six to ten is kind of the larger range mm -hmm. that you use. Typically, if we're looking at kind of minus three, minus two, we want to be around that seven grams per kilogram. Mm -hmm. um, so for those that might be watching that aren't sure what grams per kilogram means, effectively, if you weigh a hundred kg, just to give you an easy example, a hundred kg, and you need seven grams per kilogram, you'd need seven hundred grams of carbohydrates across the day to mm -hmm. ensure that you're getting carbohydrate and, and macros in. So yeah, so for me, it's seven grams. Seven, seven grams on that kind of optimizing phase, which is your standard for footballers anyway. Minus mm -hmm. two, you might want to look towards maybe upping it to seven to eight grams per kilogram. But again, not much emphasis on that kind of, um, you know, really pushing on the carbs. And then mm -hmm. minus one, we're probably looking more towards 10 grams per kilogram. 
So that loading of carbohydrates with those extra carb snacks would probably push you up by about three grams per kilogram more than what you'd normally have, which would set you in good stead, ready to go for the game the next day. Normally, I find with athletes that I work with that in football for the actual game day itself, because the regular kind of the regulatory system of the body is used to going for seven grams per kilogram, a seven gram per kilogram approach on a game day is actually more beneficial than keeping it at 10 grams per kilogram because it allows the gut to kind of digest. Mm -hmm. We've already got the carbs in. We don't necessarily need to have even more on the day of a game. We just need to focus on staying kind of well energized and ready to go for performance. Yeah. So an interesting tactic that I use is the rule of halves. Have you heard of that? Explain it a little bit, just to make sure I've got the right. Yeah, so on the day of my game, say for example, um, I would have my biggest carb meal six hours previous or before kickoff. Then three hours before, I would have a, a meal half the size of that, and then an hour and a half before, I would have a small carb based snack before the game. So that's what I find works for me. Say for example, I have an afternoon kickoff. Um, I was just wondering if you knew of that because I got that from another nutritionist um, one day and I think that really works for me because it helps me from not feeling bloated and having too much in the gut and stuff. So as you say, like it's more about focusing on the days before and then just hopping up on the day. Yeah, definitely. No, I agree. And I think I've, I've heard the rule of halves before and I think it works well in in practice when the game's later in the day. If it's not later in the day and it's like mm -hmm. 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I always go three, I always say start eating your last big meal three and a half hours prior, knowing you're going to finish it within half an hour. So you'll have three hours to digest it, which is effectively like you say what a previous nutritionist has said, which is a perfect way of doing it. But I think it's how you build up to that. So to me, I always say, you know, depending on the athlete, it depends whether they have their last big meal three hours before or if they have it at breakfast that morning. Either works well because the fuel's still in the body. It's just more dependent on that athlete and their training and, and nutrition patterns and what they're currently doing. Uh, but yeah, I agree completely. Like you say, that three and three hours or three and a half hours before I like to say, because if you're a slow eater and it's going to take you half an hour, 40 minutes to finish your dish, what you don't want to be doing is finishing that meal two hours and 15 minutes before a competition. Give yourself three hours of a digestion window. So half an hour to eat and then three hours to digest that food before the game. And those that I suppose struggle with anxiety or potential match their nerves, which can always be a big area that um, we focus on as nutritionists, you know, having a smaller meal and some form of like liquid energy. So a smoothie mm -hmm. for example, or snacking a little bit more. So maybe going for some toast or a bagel alongside your meal can break down that meal a little bit more. So you're not overfacing yourself with a big bowl of pasta um, or whatever it might be that you consume in before a game. Yeah, that's great advice because that's something that would maybe affect me to agree. Maybe not so much nerves, but maybe more excitement sometimes. You know, it's kind of the same thing. And like, I just don't feel like I want to eat before a competition. So that's a great idea, getting it in liquid form, just so it's easier to get down, digest. It's not going to leave you feeling heavy and stuff. So that's great. So I think that covers that really well, Dan. So I want to cover a wee bit on like post-game nutrition because a lot of these guys have high training schedules, maybe double game weeks and stuff. So it's important, I know, to get the post-game nutrition in early to help with the recovery process. So, like, what would your advice be to any player watching about how to optimise your post-game recovery? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, and you, you mentioned, like, double game weeks, since, I suppose, one of the teams I work with dropped to the championship, i.e. Leeds, there's been a lot <laughs> of game weeks in that. And actually, with our under-21s, we find that we get a lot of double game weeks and um, potentially cup mm -hmm. competition straight into a league competition. So we, we're quite adverse or I should say versatile in terms of adapting to those um, scenarios. And I think the best way of doing so is, yes, protein as soon as we can. Just understand that the more protein doesn't equal the better recovery. And I feel like I'm a broken record and I say this in every single talk that I always speak about. Now, more protein over a long period of time will give you better recovery. But in one hit, our body can only absorb so much protein. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at it typically for a footballer, it's between 20 and 40 grams of protein. So if you've got a 30 gram protein shake following training or following a max, and yes, perfect, that's going to tick the box. It's going to start muscle protein synthesis, the recovery um, of the muscles following that game. However, if you double scoop that shake, you're adding no additional nutritional benefit to the body in that period of time by having 60 grams of protein. Or another prime example of that, and I've seen it done quite a bit with athletes, is they'll have a protein shake whilst also munching on a chicken wrap and a protein bar. 
they'd be having about 120 grams of protein. Whereas if it's a short turnaround, the focus has to be on the regeneration of carbohydrates and improving um, your glycogen stores and bringing that back to kind of normal range again, once depleting them. So the focus then shifts from let's get the protein in as soon as we can to start muscle protein synthesis. So as soon as we step off the pitch, if we're subbed off or, you know, if we've finished the 90 minute match, go and grab that shake while you're getting changed, having your shower, because that's going to elicit mm -hmm. protein synthesis as soon as we physically can possibly get it in. And then look towards the carb options and the fruit and veg for recovery, because that fruit and veg will boost your immune system, stop you getting ill when the body's at its lowest and also support that overall recovery following that game and then we can look towards increasing protein again so typically every two to three hours you want to hit a protein obviously whilst you're awake we're not going to get up in the middle of the night and have a no. have something so we'd look towards having you know a protein shake following training or sorry following the match or potentially a high protein meal as soon as we can get it in and then after after that maybe an hour to two hours following that we'd look to get our next hit of protein in which might come from a meal such as you know a chicken wrap for example or potentially like a pulled pork bow bun or something along that like a little snack or something that's a little bit more of a treat um ideally if we've got short turnarounds staying away from the dominoes and the mcdonald's because we need to make sure we're optimizing the body for the next performance that's coming up yeah, very interesting, um, especially the fact that a lot of these guys may not know that you should actually drip free or drip feed your protein throughout the day. Um, for a lot of the athletes that I may have on, they'll or even some guys in here, you'll probably have a protein goal for that day. And say, for example, you have 100 grams of protein hit at the end of that day. Like, it's not going to serve you well just getting that all in at the end of the day. Yeah, so yeah, completely agree there. Um, next point I want to cover, which is something that I would like to personally know more around, is hydration and how important that is for your game day, and like how to improve your hydration through the likes of supplements, electrolytes, and stuff like that. And how should you handle that on your game? Yeah, certainly. I think just generally hydration is important for athletes to reduce fatigue, muscle cramps, and the likes. I love how we grabbed that bottle of water there, Dylan. Mm -hmm. Saying that Step all the time, lads. <laughs> Even here. tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> but I think the the big thing is like unless we're doing sweat testing, unless we're working out sweat rates of athletes, it's very difficult to re effectively without the science to say this is exactly how much water you require for this amount of time during a session. You've also got to consider other variables in the session, such as, you know, if we're looking to hydrate for a training session or rehydrate afterwards, you got to consider potentially the coaches might run you a bit harder, a bit lighter, you know, potentially there's a perception of that some tasks you find easy on a pitch, you find harder on a pitch, potentially the weather. It's quite sunny over here in Manchester today, but there's certainly days where it's, um, you know, a little bit colder than what it is now. And also potentially, you know, it's a little bit warmer, which might increase um your hydration or your need for for replenishment but i think the big thing there is like the one thing that we can do and all athletes can do is to just check in a scientific test on yourself which is to check your urine color you know if we're constantly in that kind of darker color of urine we know that we're dehydrated so we need to look to increase our um, intake of water we know typically two to three liters a day is going to suffice for most healthy athletes uh, most healthy adults but not athletes Normally, we'd say around 250 mil every one hour of, uh, sorry, every 15 to 20 minutes of exercise, which would equate to about a litre per hour of exercise. And then following our training, we want around one and a half litres over the next one and a half hours to be able to rehydrate the body. But what that doesn't mean is that we go, okay, I need three litres of water to hydrate, um, to be a healthy hydration. I'm doing two hours of training, so I need a further two, uh, two litres of water to uh, compensate for that. And then I need that 1.5 litres of water after training, which would be, I think, six and a half or five and a half litres. That's not going to be the case that we can just add it up using simple maths because it will all depend on sweat rates, your current hydration status, and also your ability to actually drink water during a session. So be mindful that there isn't really numbers that I can say in this session that you need to do X, Y, and Z, apart from two to three litres is kind of healthy individual um, water intake and then look towards supplementing a bit more water when it comes to training. Now, supplements, you know, we've got all kinds of supplements out there. And I think big disclaimer is obviously if we are looking towards playing in the professional world, we want to make sure that they're informed sport and batch tested. So making sure they've got the little informed sport logo on it that gives us that kind of reputability and knowing that it's tested for any banned substances and it's actually legitimately good for performance. So electrolyte tablets um, can be really useful to add to your water. So when we sweat, 
sweat. We don't just sweat water. We sweat all kinds of different electrolytes that we need to replace. The two big ones being sodium and potassium. Um, I think going off the, on a tangent on that, because we've got a, probably a, a lot of young footballers watching this, is unfortunately prime hydration drink isn't very good for hydrating. Um, I've done a little bit piece on that and I've, I've spoke about it a little bit from the science that's behind prime is the annoyance is they've got too much electrolytes in there and actually they've got the they've got the um, the formula the wrong way around. So the sodium potassium doesn't add up as it should which means that actually we can be causing ourselves more dehydration. Yes, have Prime as like an enjoyable drink like you would a fizzy drink or, you know, a can of Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. but don't use it for hydration. Try and look towards either electrolytes as like the tablets or powders that we can buy. Or if you want to make a homemade one, you can quite easily do it with some lemon juice, honey and some Himalayan pink salt. And that will give you the kind of the, the same electrolyte compound um, that you'd need to be able to kind of create that electrolyte drink that you need. But replacing them allows for fluid balance to come back a lot quicker, which I think is really important in those short turnaround moments that we mentioned earlier of back-to-back -back games potentially or back-to-back -back training sessions. Awesome. It's mad that you talk about that prime drink as well. And it's the official drink of the likes of Barcelona and stuff. But I'm sure you won't see the likes of their athletes drinking that on the sidelines. No, I I got um, I, I had one of those moments where I got like triggered uh, the other day. I was on my Instagram just flicking through some stories, and it, I think it was the um it was either Barca or Arsenal uh, or Arsenal. I can't remember. But it was like they oh, yes, they, Arsenal, they have their own um like academy of nutrition that they deliver sessions for, and they had images. And funnily enough, the players weren't drinking the prime bottles. They just had a branded prime bottle. Ah. So they weren't actually drinking prime as far as I'm aware, because I don't think the nutritionist would be too keen on that. However, mm -hmm. it was the fact that they were advertising the nutrition course with a prime bottle in there, thinking if that's going to be your first lesson in that course that you should be drinking prime, then it's it's going to be a downhill slope from there. So uh yeah, interesting that you know, like you say. It's the same as, you know, Red Bull or, you know, Monster Energy or any of those kind of energy drink brands that sponsor teams as well. Um, you know, realistically, probably not the most optimal source of caffeine to have as a fizzy drink before competition. But some athletes do enjoy having uh, a Red Bull and the like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the same as, you know, any kind of, you know, back in the day when Carlsberg used to sponsor Liverpool or whatever that might have been. It's the same as that. It doesn't mean that it's good for performance because it's mm -hmm. on the shirt. So just be mindful sometimes of those products that are coming out. Awesome. That's interesting. Um, you were saying the like so because I know a lot of guys in the changing room will have their Red Bulls, their monsters, right before kickoff. So you say that it's probably not the best way to go about it. So in your own words, like what's the best way to go about caffeinate or using caffeine for you? So caffeine can be a tricky one. And I think recommending it has to be on a personal level. So mm -hmm. yes, I can give some tips on when and um, how to have caffeine, but numbers wise, you know, realistically, I'd say without a nutritionist kind of supporting you, don't try going for any of the high dose caffeine, stay below mm -hmm. 400 milligrams. There's a lot of research that does show that up to nine milligrams per kilogram of body weight is beneficial for performance, but we're touching on that line of dangerous. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. But realistically, you know, anything below 400 milligrams before we take part in sport is a safe dose of caffeine that we know we can all kind of utilize. And as well, if we're talking younger performers, those under 16 um, that are potentially not fully developed, we want to kind of avoid caffeine because there's not mm -hmm. any benefit to using caffeine earlier. Um, whereas, you know, using electrolytes, for example, earlier can still help with hydration. So yeah, when we're looking at caffeine, you, ideally you want to be getting it from sources like coffees, et cetera, that are natural earlier in the day to kind of boost that kind of energy level and, and maintain a bit of, um, you know, a period of time where caffeine's in the body. We use um, at a lot of the clubs I work at caffeine gums, caffeine gels, because I think they can be kind of easily absorbed and easily digested. Whereas Red Bulls or, you know, any other kind of energy drink brand, um, yes, some of them might be sugar free um, and, you know, necessarily potentially not even the best if they are sugar free, because you might want the sugars for your performance. Mm -hmm. They, the fizzy drinks that, you know, if we get nerves or like you said, Dylan, earlier, excitement, um, probably going to sit uneasy on the stomach and affect that digestion. So think about kind of, you know, not disrupting your performance by using caffeine. Caffeine can have, you know, ultimate benefits on explosive power, endurance and supporting an athlete generally in a game of football. But realistically, if it's going to come at a detriment of feeling 
awful before we take part in the game, then it's probably best to avoid. So yeah, caffeine gums and gels are always the way forward. Or some of the companies like Nutrition X do a little mini explode shot um, that is effectively just a, a non-fizzy um, shot of caffeine in a liquid form that we can just kind of take really quickly. I know that's quite a fan favourite with some of the Leeds players um, in the first team. They prefer using that over having a Red Bull because they find the fizz just kind of sits on the stomach and doesn't really help them with their performance. Interesting, dude. Thanks for that. Um, so what I'd like to ask next is a lot of the guys would like to know, like, what would your top tips be for just simplifying simplify nutrition for them? So say, for example, kind of touched on it earlier, like someone starting out, but for just the general athlete who's looking to improve their match day performance and their overall recovery, like what would you advise? What would be your top tips for them? Yeah, definitely. I think the first one is think about the start and the end of the day. So how are you going to how are you going to start the day well and how are you going to end it well as well? So I think the first section for me would be to look towards um, having a good breakfast every day, even if it's a rest day. Just think about, you know, when we look at kind of our TDE, 95% of our total day energy expenditure comes from just being alive and moving around day to day. 5% of that energy expenditure comes from our training and match play. So we still need to fuel even on the days we're not performing. So focus on a good breakfast that's high in carbs, a good hit of protein and plenty of fruit and veg. You know, that could just be a bowl of oats because we've, we've some, you know, frozen fruit chucked on top of it with some honey. And then, you know, potentially looking towards that evening as well, making sure we're bookending the end of the day with some good, good protein and good carbs. So my recommendation is always like granola, yogurt, and ensuring that there's some fruit on top of there as well. I think tip one is just like I say, bookend the start and the and the end of the day. I say the, the start and the, yeah, the end of the day, making sure they're in good in good practice. I think probably to give you two more tips, to kind of go away with three big tips is I think you mentioned it earlier as well about that um, about the protein and splitting it up across the day. So work out what your requirements of protein are. That can be anywhere between 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram a day, depending on your size and stature and your build and kind of what your goals are and how well you recover. Um, so, you know, take that number, divide it up across the day into kind of four or five, potentially six if we need equals hits of protein to allow for that muscle protein synthesis to continually regenerate. What tends to happen, just quickly to digress on that one, is if we start here with our muscle protein synthesis, we get a nice big spike in muscle protein synthesis. Then after a couple of hours, we dip back down to kind of normal levels. We want to keep that spike and that wave going across the day. And if you go and look anywhere, you know, across the internet about muscle protein synthesis, you'll see some really good graphs from the research that shows how to make sure we stay within that threshold and we're able to continually regenerate the muscles, regrow and repair them as well. And I think finally, I think we touched on it a lot, but I think sleep and hydration um, is, you know, two of the big areas that, yes, I'm not a sleep expert, but nutrition falls quite comfortably with sleep. You know, if we're struggling to sleep, we don't want to be looking to medicate to sleep better. We need to focus on better foods during the day to fuel the day better. And then actually in the evening, looking towards foods that are high in magnesium. Um, so nuts, bananas, dark chocolate are all really good sources that should help us hit that REM sleep a little bit better. And as well, you know, hydrating across the day, but making sure we're not over hydrating in the evening. You mentioned about you know, some athletes that you've worked with, Dill, um, and you were talking about how they'd leave all their 100 grams of protein to the end of the day. Same with hydration. Don't leave your three, four liters to the end of the day or else that'll disrupt your sleep and actually be up and down all night going to the toilet. So making sure that our hydration is actually, you know, considered similar to protein, little and often sips across the day to ensure that we're getting the best out of our kind of hydration and staying hydrated and then sleep. Of course, we want around seven to nine hours each evening. Those that might be watching as well, just to digress on that point, that are a little bit younger, you might actually need more sleep. So realistically, if you're looking more in your teen years, where you've still got a lot of maturing and, and maturation to do, you might even be looking at 10 plus hours of sleep a night that you might require for the body. So if you're one of those athletes that are watching this, you know, either live or on the recording um, and thinking I can never, you know, never function or wake up for school in the morning or can never function and wake up for college, it might be that you're going to bed too late. Yes, mm -hmm. you need yourself nine hours but your body might require 10, 11 hours and that compounding 
kind of interest over the over the week of sleep debt is going to then lead into the next week and make us feel even worse. So consider that actually, yes, you might be getting seven hours of good quality sleep, but your body might require nine every night. And you imagine even just over five days, that's a 10 hour sleep debt that we're looking at. So make sure that we're kind of prioritizing that as well. Yeah, it's very interesting. There's definitely been a big shift anyway in the performance world of just like how important sleep actually is at the moment. Like the studies showing like just how much more likely you are to get injured if you're not sleeping properly and stuff like that as well. So obviously this all ties in together, nutrition and sleep whenever it comes to recovery. So we need to focus on that. You touched on a point as well, something that I'm interested in knowing your views on is for me, for example, it's going to say nuts. I train from nine to 10 on a Tuesday evening. So how do you optimize your recovery and what nutrition strategy do you use for a player, for example, who might train very late in the evening and then have like work the next day and the next morning? Like, What would your advice be around that? Yeah, so if I'm honest, a lot of the research that's now coming out, well, has come out around protein intake. And we know that protein is important post-training, but we also know that it doesn't work linearly. So like if you don't have protein, after training, you still it doesn't mean you're not going to get the effects from mm -hmm. that recovery. So there's a lot of studies now that are showing that if you've got a 9 to 10 p.m. training session, if you're able to digest and consume protein an hour before training, actually in those two hours, you're still going to get the, the effects of the recovery once you finish training. So it's not a case of having to have a really large meal when you get home. Mm -hmm. Yes, you might want to top that up with some form of casein protein, which is slower mm -hmm. releasing for the evening to help you recover better. So when you get back into work the next morning and obviously your job being quite, um, you know, physically demanding allows you to kind of recover overnight. But I think, you know, realistically, try and get all your fueling in before 9 p.m., your main fueling. And then looking, like I said, on that tip number one that we spoke about, bookending the day with some good carbs and good protein. So again, it might be a you know a high casein um, yogurt with um, some mm -hmm. granola and fruit in there after training. Because realistically, all of our fueling will have been done during the day, which allows us then to recover effectively without having to like shove a load of protein and a load of carbs into the body and, and then try and sleep that off, which isn't going to happen because our digestive system will just be functioning all night and keeping mm -hmm. us up, stopping us from getting to that deep sleep phase that we require for recovery. So if we front load the day with our energy, it'd be much easier for yourself. It's not a case of that we have to stay up late at night. And I think some easy tips is like, prepping your food before um you know if you're going to have a bowl of granola and yogurt with some fruit don't wait till you get home to chop up all the fruit put the yogurt in the bowl with the granola make it earlier in the day take it to maybe training in a tupperware and then on your drive or you walk home however that might look you can actually start consuming that so actually once you get home the focus is shower brush your teeth and go to bed as opposed to mm -hmm. make food and keep awake and stay alert yeah, optimization your sleep past that. So I'm interested to know, does the same rules apply for, say, for example, you have a game on a Tuesday night and you're finishing at maybe half nine, quarter to ten. Like, does the same rule apply or because there's such a gap between your last feed and full time, would there be any differences to that for anyone? Or what do you think? Yeah, so typically... For most athletes that are playing one sport, you will get the following day as a recovery day. So mm -hmm. there is, unless obviously unique situation potentially where your role requires you to be physically active in your job the following mm -hmm. day. But for most athletes, it will be a recovery or a lighter day the following day. And, you know, we will need some food to potentially, you know, just fuel through that recovery day. So, yeah, you know, prime example is there is some games at the moment, isn't it? They're like 8.15 8 in the evening, they kick off and actually mm -hmm. players aren't done or back in the changing room till, you know, kind of near 10 o'clock or, or, you know, more towards 10 p.m. at night. I'd say the best way to go about this is you are going to be spending time potentially in the changing rooms, getting changed and showering. It's what food you can have in the changing rooms ready to go. So you're not waiting until you're back home. Yes, not ideal that even at 10 o'clock at night, you're still consuming food. But you can do that whilst you're showering, potentially celebrating with the team um, or, you know, looking towards kind of refueling as quick as we can. So taking a pasta pot in with you or taking some form of, you know, maybe chicken fajitas to eat cold as you're getting changed to go home is much better than waiting until you get home and consuming that food. So almost like we do it quite a lot with, you know, some of the first teams I've worked with is we'll have the kitchen almost on standby with hot plates um, and they'll mm -hmm. have the 
of food prepared um, and they're just kind of grab and go situations. Grab a box, fill it with wraps, um, wedges, you know, any kind of little spicy rice pots that they might want to consume, etc. But actually have it in the changing rooms whilst you're getting changed, chatting to everybody, waiting for, you know, the drivers to come or the coach to pull around. Um, and it's a case of then we know that we've hit that point of refueling. So when you get home, it might be that you're still hungry, but actually you could go and enjoy something to eat. Then you could have, you know, potentially a dessert or something like that. Or that granola pot that we mentioned earlier with yogurt is always a good winner. Or maybe some like, you know, jam on toast or peanut butter on toast, etc. But I think just something that we can get in the changing room is much better to start with than looking towards trying to eat when we're home. Because again, it's going to be maybe gone 11 o'clock by the time that rolls around. And again, in, in an ideal world, you'd obviously sleep in till if you got on at 11, you'd obviously sleep in till 8 a.m. in the morning, get your nine hours in. That's not always realistic. So it's what can we do to optimize the sleep? And actually trying to eat as far away from the time we go to bed um, is obviously much better, but potentially throwing some more magnesium-based foods in there to elicit better sleep as well would be beneficial. Awesome, mate. Like, that was absolutely brilliant in terms of the quality of information that you were able to give us. Absolutely loved it. Took so much away from it myself. Um, just before we end the call and we end the conversation, I always like to end on the same point. And I, I, I always ask the, the guest, sorry, um, if you could give everybody here watching one young athlete um, one piece of advice, what would it be before we go? Yeah. So from a nutrition perspective, I feel as though is the, is the best way to go around it is listen to your body. You know, if you're feeling hungry and you're feeling underfueled, then you probably are. The body will give you most of the signals you require. And I think, you know, just to leave it on that is brilliant. We've spoke about hydration. We've spoke about sleep. Your body will tell you if you're dehydrated. Your body will tell you if you're underslept and your body will tell you if you're underfueled. So if you listen to your body, you won't go too far wrong. Awesome, mate. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. I think everybody watching or everybody who will get to watch this video will really appreciate it and take a lot from it as well. So thank you so much, Dan, for coming on. Really appreciate it. And yeah, maybe we'll get you back on soon sometime. Definitely. If we can ever get you again. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dylan. And thank you for having me on. And I appreciate it. Thanks. No oh, just before you go, um, where can everybody find you at? Good point. Uh, so on Instagram, uh, I am at DRN Nutrition. So there's a double N in there because it's DRN Nutrition. Or you can go over to Twitter, which I think it's DRN Nutri because someone had DRN Nutrition already. Uh, they're probably the two best places to reach out to me. Uh, we have got a website as well, but it's currently down getting uh, upgraded a little bit. But that is DRN.co.uk. Uh, Once that's back up and running, go check out kind of some of the stuff I do. But grab me on Instagram for now. Normally the easiest way to contact me. Thank you. Awesome, guys. I'm going to send in a comment with a link and it's going to give a link to Dan's profile. So definitely hit him up. Definitely follow him. Um, because he will give you so much advice on taking your game forward. Thanks so much for coming on, Dan. We'll leave it on a high note. All the best. Thanks so Thank much, you. Mick. Cheers, Dylan. Take care. All the best. Bye. Bye.